All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, and boy, do we have a doozy today. Now, in this episode, we see the return of Nicholas, and he and I chat with legendary writer Michael Moorcock on the origins of sword and sorcery, the Blitz of London, World War II, Elric of Melnibane, Chaos, Anarchy, the Blues, and more. Also, I'd like to give a brief shout out to Deathmaster of Doom Sword and the Guards of Lorn Facebook group for submitting some of the questions I was able to ask Michael near the end. And Michael has assured me that any questions we didn't get to this go around, we can surely tackle in a future interview. As always, thank you for listening. And if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> well, Michael, uh, first of all, Nick and I are huge fans. Thank you so much for you know giving us some of your time. It's a pleasure to get a chance to speak with you. Well, you're welcome. We thought you may be uh, uh, too busy celebrating the coronation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I've been a Republican <coughs> with a small R pretty much my entire life, ever since I could think. So I'm not, <laughs> well, I'm not exactly celebrating anything at the moment. <laughs> the, the only thing that I, I'm reminded of is that the first King Charles had his head cut off. So, you know, you never know. Might be. History does repeat itself. Right? Michael, just so we have a starting point here, I like to start off by asking our guest to take us back in time and. Obviously, you were born in the midst of World War II. Why don't you take us to the, some of your earliest memories that you can recall of your childhood? Well, oddly enough, I, I don't know why, but my earliest, probably my earliest memory is of my mother holding me up to a window to watch a dog fight <laughs> going on. <laughs> wow. We, 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 we lived between three airfields. So we were, fed, and we were also well. We were particularly prone to V bombing, not 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 so much to the regular bombing, but when the V bombing started, Churchill decided that since we were of no strategic importance, he would pretend to the Germans that uh, they were striking important targets, <laughs> and uh, and so we got an awful lot. Of, we got the most rockets hitting us uh, of anybody in in uh, in the country. But I don't remember being scared or anything. It's it, you know, it was the adults who were always the ones who made light of it and kept you cheerful and everything. And I rather liked the. We had an indoor shelter which was steel sheets, essentially under a table. You know, the sheets were around the table, and it was but rather rather nice, uh, particularly in the winter because there was a fire going. You know, in the grate. And, and also, of course, I, I was downstairs with the adults, so I could. I felt rather, rather happy about that. I remember feeling extremely, you know, <laughs> enjoying it quite a bit. Nice and cozy. And the, the funny thing was, you know, I was playing with toy soldiers, anti-aircraft guns, and that sort of thing, while the war was on. I mean, it's a very, very odd thing that really the whole, the whole thing should make you pretty schizophrenic. It didn't really, I don't think it, it but it, it certainly didn't. It wasn't traumatic. I, I've come to think that in some ways, when people talk about childhood trauma, I mean, I'm, I mean, there are serious childhood traumas, of course, and, I, and I'm not dismissing those. But in a lot of ways, it's the adults who get the trauma, not not the kids. I suspect the same might be going on in Ukraine and, and Syria and elsewhere at the moment. You know, the, the kids go on. But we used to go out after an air raid. We used to go out onto the common. We had a great big stretch of common land just near us. 
and we used to go out and look for bits of you know, bits of planes, bits of shrapnel and so on. And we collected it and swapped it like you know, like kids do baseball cards and stuff like that. And we were always hoping we'd find a dead German, you know, that with with, the, <laughs> with, with all his equipment intact, you know, we could loot, but we, we never did. <laughs> not so lucky, huh? People did used to run out and you know, not worry at all about the parachute, just the guy had come down out of his parachute, but they'd go for the parachute because the parachutes were made of silk. And you could make all kinds of clothing out of that silk. So lots and lots of people had underwear made of German parachutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was an odd thing. I think in some ways, my, my sense of, as it were, a, a malleable world of worlds was because pretty much every, every day during the V-bombing anyway, when you went outside, something that had been there was there no longer, you know, it had been it had been hit and blasted. We never actually got hit. We got the house next door got hit and it kind of made it made our house shake a lot. We didn't actually get get hit at the time. So in a way I had a I had a what what for my age would be a fairly normal war. We were evacuated, but my mother couldn't stand being away from London. I didn't blame her. So she came back with me, and <laughs> so we went through the whole war unevacuated. But, so I don't have any evac evacuation stories at all. You know, I, She just didn't like the people we were supposed to stay with and <laughs> just preferred to come home. <laughs> Michael, what do you think, growing up in that sort of turmoil, how did that inform the materials that you sought in fantasy? I think it did make, make me realize, or rather make me think of the, of the world as, as an impermanent sort of place, you know, something that, that my sense of chaos at any rate was informed by that, the sense of things changing all the time. And in a way, of course, even after the war, things were still changing. There was a lot of damage. There was a lot of rebuilding. Again, some of my fondest memories are of the immediate, well, the, la the sort of first 10 years after the war. It took a long time to rebuild because, you know, Britain was broke at the end of it, too. Uh, in fact, owing you guys a lot of money, which they only paid off about 10 <laughs> years ago, I think. And so there was austerity and, and there, you know, the building was not rapid as, as it would be today. Yeah, you know, it was because London changes you know, every five minutes nowadays, the skyline, you know, I don't recognize the skyline. It's, it's, uh, I'm in central London. I just, uh, I don't recognize it at all. So, so through the first part of the, the you know, as I say, the first 10 years or so was, was a world of ruins really. And it was in that sense, somewhat romantic. And also because so few of the 18th century and 17th century buildings had been saved or hadn't been hit. You could see London almost as it might have been in at that time. You could see St. Paul's, you know, for, for a long distance, whereas now it's all built up all around it. You can't see, you know, you can't just walk from, say, London Bridge to St. Paul's and be sure of seeing it all the way. But I started working young. I left school early and, and so I was, I was working when I was 15 and I was working in the city and there were where there were walkways people had actually made, pathways people had made through the rubble. You know, the rubble had been cleared back, of course. Um, and uh, again, I had a rather romantic view of London at, at, at that time. I could walk from, say, the monument, which which is which was the the big thing built after the Great Fire of London. Most of London, of course, is only was is, is not. It's actually younger than some parts of America, because because it all burnt down, mm. in, in, and and people had already started building. You know, building a building in America by then, so so it's a it's it's a kind of odd thing. You can go to America and feel that you're in an earlier you know an earlier part of time in, in England. I must say it was a, it was a, it was a very good time to live in for me. I didn't much like the fifties as the fifties because there wasn't very. I didn't like the pop music very much <laughs> until sort of rock and roll started to come in. There wasn't much choice of clothing, for instance. You know, you everybody you know wore a suit on pretty much nothing else. Again, it, it was a time when in, your imagination came into play quite a bit. And I was lucky in that my father, who who ran off as soon as the war, you know, virtually as soon as the war was declared over, 
he, he, he disappeared. And I've never been more grateful, I have to say. I'm, this was, again, not traumatic for me. Uh, or if it was, it was, it was, uh, it was well offset by the, the virtues that, that, that came out of it. He, I, I don't know whether he actually read much. He did read a little bit of, um, of imaginative stuff. But he wasn't a very imaginative man, and he he. But he left behind uh, two Edgar Rice Burroughs books and a couple of historical fiction uh, pieces of his, which uh, rather Phoenician, I think, being one of them. And rather Phoenician is about um, it's sort of it's 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 in the early sort of years of of fantasy as we know it today. But that was about a man who lived through various times as a as a soldier. So it, it, it must have strongly influenced, I don't remember reading it, tell you the <laughs> truth, but, but it, I'm, I'm sure it, it, it influenced my ideas for the, for the eternal champion later on. And of course, the Burroughs, one was a Tarzan book, one was a Martian book. They, they were out of sequence, they weren't the first ones, but I really enjoyed those. And so I could read before I went to school, so I was, I was already a very keen reader. Luckily for us in England, the Edgar Rice Burroughs books never went out of print. They were constantly in the little commercial lending libraries that we had, where for a tuppence a week you could you could take out you know a book and you know, for sixpence you got three, as it were. So I, so I could take out the whole John Carter, uh, your first John Carter series, and first Tarzan series, and various other others, of course, as well. Although I never could get on with Van Vogt at that age, I, I, I couldn't understand him at all. But, uh, but 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 I did I did read all of the Burroughs books, including you know a lot of the ones that that just weren't in print at all in the states for, for very long. Like although he did a, a, an historical and he did a, he did a western and so on, which which did, did, until the sixties didn't just weren't appearing in, in the States. So I was very lucky in that sense. Plenty plenty to read, you know, plenty of imaginative stuff to read. Lots of stuff, I, I, I started buying secondhand books, of course, as soon as I could, I could actually move about on my own accord, as it were, <laughs> without, without, without a parent. I started fanzines very early too. First one was called Book Collector's News which I don't know whether it was news for anybody but me, but still it was. <laughs> um, and then I did an Edgar Sparrows fanzine called Burrowsania, not Burrowsiana, which it should have been called, but I, I misread <laughs> the title of another, but another Burrows fanzine, and so mine was Burrows, Burrowsania. And through that, I, I very quickly met other Burrows fans, and through and a lot of those were were part of regular science fiction fandom. And in those days, of course, you you could only meet other science fiction fans through print. And we had a magazine called Exchange and Mart, in which you advertised either for books you wanted or for you know for clubs you were forming and that sort of thing. And so I met a lot of other fanzine producers very quickly and got into science fiction fandom. I mean, by the time I was fifteen, I was I was you know I was sort of corresponding regularly with a lot of a lot of other other SF fans. So it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a happy chant for me. But those, just those two books, my my father left behind. I mean, it, he couldn't have left me a better inheritance, actually. He, you know, he left me a, my my means of making a living, really. <laughs> exactly, uh, Michael. When did you first pick up an instrument? I was about fifteen too. I had a collection of toy soldiers. I I still do collect toy soldiers, but the, and I regret doing this, but I. I sold, I think I sold the collection or swapped it uh, of, of toy soldiers and bought, well, first I bought a drum kit, which I had to, of course, practice at the end of the, in the shed at the end of the garden. <laughs> and then, then uh, I wasn't too happy with that. I mean, I, I, I drum reasonably. I, I was, I, I had to, I, well, I didn't have to, but I joined a, the uh, Air Training Corps, which was the sort of pre-RAF, it's the sort of boys' RAF, because in those days there was conscription. And if you joined the RAF, if you joined the ATC, it gave you a leg up in the, uh, it put you automatically into the RAF. And if you were in the RAF, you could learn a, learn a, a trade, or um, uh, which a lot of people did, you know, communications, that sort of thing, things that you needed in the area. So it was thought to be the best way to spend your 
two years national service. As it happened, I never did national service because they, they, they scrapped it about two seconds before I was due to go in. And so I'd wasted all that time marching about being being humiliated by sergeants and all the usual stuff. But, I, I, but we did have a drum and pipe band and I wasn't allowed to play the pipes. I didn't particularly want to play the pipes, but I, but I, I did play the, the, the snare drum and we played a snare drum, you know, as we went along. So, so the drum was obviously my first, first instrument, but I then uh, swapped that drum kit for a banjo and the banjo for a guitar. <laughs> and so eventually, you know, but I, I taught myself the banjo and, and, and I was known in around other musicians later on as being able to play almost any stringed instrument like a banjo <laughs> I could actually actually uh, pick a pick a banjo pretty pretty well by you know by the time I was about 16 or 17 so a lot of the time the the, the guitar that I, I was actually playing by that time I was in a, I was in skiffle bands you know we, we as we call them and uh, we, we we were just you know, we just went to sort of local dances and little concerts and things like that and made no money whatsoever but <laughs> in fact we were lucky not to be booed off the stage i think half the time but i was a great woody guthrie fan um i'd come across woody guthrie very early and i'd written to woody and woody had written back so i'd had a, a sort of a lively correspondence with, with 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 woody guthrie very early on and so so i was inclined to sing some of his rather long songs in concert which were not particularly popular with, with people who wanted don't you rock me daddy or something you know something like that and i, I was singing you know the about mining disasters or, 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 or strikes or, or stuff like that <laughs> but i suppose it was early early that got me into an early early folk music that was how uh, i got into the folk music scene which of course um in the 50s was 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 in its infancy I and mean, then in in america it was around pete seeger and uh, the, the little group that he was in and then of course became commercial with people like thing of me paul and mary i can't can't remember their names very well but who who kind of commercialized and made palatable for the 50s audience that that kind of music and we of course were in deep contempt had deep contempt for um for all that stuff we were, we were purists also a lot of black musicians black blues musicians were coming to england at that time because they had an audience in england which they didn't have they didn't have the same kind of audience same width of audience in america so i was able to meet an awful lot of you know very famous um, black blues players and just hang around with them and and pick up their licks and stuff like that of course i wasn't the only person who did that there were there were people uh, alex corner who was really essentially one of the most important of the english blues musicians and who taught eric clapton and all those old people of that generation slightly younger generation my generation really so in london we were all pretty much blues orientated in what we what we performed and in liverpool which was the other kind of main center of of american uh, influence music mm. they were more they were more i like buddy holly and 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 a lot of a lot of the rock and rollers but the but in liverpool it was really the rock, rock and rollers that, that the main influence so they were the main influence on the beatles and all of the liverpool groups and in London, it was mostly blues. So you got bands like the Yardbirds that Clapton first appeared in, and 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 we learned pretty much directly from the blues players. It was it was a happy coincidence. It was a bit strange in a way because we were, you know, there there wasn't the same kind of prejudice in in England as there was in 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 America for black players. But the black players sometimes thought they were being insulted or. or set up in some way when the cultures clashed and i remember you know i had a lot of friends who who were backing the likes of howling wolf and, and people like that and i remember a friend of mine who's we were in a band together later but telling me that howling wolf had, after a gig howling wolf had said he was hungry you know and in those days 
restaurants tended to close down fairly early in London. So the only place that was open was a, was a burger place near Paddington, which just sold burgers. I mean, it didn't, didn't have a variety of stuff. It just sold hamburgers. And Howling Wolf wanted chicken. And when they said they didn't have any chicken, he actually thought that they were, you know, that he was being basically told he couldn't be served in the restaurant, which of course wasn't wasn't the case at all. <laughs> but, you know, it's very hard for my friend to you know, to persuade him, you know, that that no, they really didn't have any chicken in the restaurant. They just <laughs> they just had hamburgers, and they were they were great guys though. I mean, they were very very friendly and nice, and you know, and and we got on with them. And of course, we admired them, and they were making a lot of money in England. Um, you know, they they were pretty happy too. So it was, a, it was a, you know, that's how we, that's how I just got into the music the same way as a lot of my contemporaries did, particularly for some reason in South London. I mean, a lot of people like Jimmy Page lived very close to me, and you know, a lot, and Mick Jagger didn't live very far away. People, people, we there were a lot of us in the same relatively small part of London. Did you ever bump into Jimmy Page? I have to ask. Just throw it out there. Um, to him, I didn't know him. Um, <laughs> I uh, I bumped into Mick Jagger. I didn't know Mick Jagger either. I mean, I, we also tended to get a little bit snotty when people became commercially successful. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so there was all of that as well. You know, think, you know, they were, the same thing happened in in America. You know, people, purists didn't think much of people who, as it were, commercialized. A song, or you know, or, or made it. In fact, often just just was successful the song. But Elvis, you know, wasn't particularly highly thought of because he was, you know, he was he he essentially commercialized black music. I, I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't that snotty, but you know, I, I, <laughs> just enough. <laughs> just enough. <laughs> So, so at this point in your life, what are you thinking about doing with your life? Is writing on the table at all? Oh yeah, um, I wanted to be a writer since I was well as long as I can remember, really. But I would say seven or eight. You know, I can remember clearly wanting to be a writer, and I was extremely lucky. Again, my father, who was a very dull man, not a, not a particularly bad man, but just dull. I I kind of could couldn't see him encouraging me the way my mother encouraged me. I mean, I had a typewriter. I was, she got a typewriter from her office. She did very well. I mean, after my, after my father left, she went out and got herself a job, a manual job in a, in a, in a timber yard. But she worked her way up from that, and she, she was a director of, that, of the company you know, within about 10 years. She got me a typewriter from, from the office, one of which I don't have the original. I gave it. I actually gave it to an American guy who I think he was. I think he was done for burglary later on. But I never got. I never got the typewriter back, unfortunately. <laughs> but it was a you know a big stand-up manual typewriter. Most of, most of my early stuff, the first Elrics and and all of the the Hawk Moon books were done um, on that manual typewriter, same typewriter. And I did little magazines from the age of I think about ten. Uh, the first one was called Outlaw's Own. It, I just filled it up with stuff, all you know, all, all my own, all my own work, um, <laughs> and sold it at school. If, if selling was quite the right word, I mean, I, I can't remember too many people being eager to snap it up. But, um, <laughs> but of course, you know, uh, parents and and aunts and uncles would buy copies, and neighbours would buy copies. I'm sure they they weren't reading it with with very much eagerness either. But I had I had a science fiction serial running in that. I must have been you know interested in that sort of thing to to start with, and then through the fanzines, which came from the age of fifteen. My first two main jobs working in in uh, professional publishing. Uh, there was a magazine called Tarzan Adventures, which was a national magazine. In fact, a Commonwealth magazine. It went all over the you know the British Commonwealth, Canada and Africa and so on, part of South Africa. I went to edit, to uh, interview the editor because I you know I was a keen Burroughs fan. The editor, of course, was not a keen Burroughs fan. He was just an old <laughs> hack who was doing a job. And and I was incredibly disappointed. So I wrote up this 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 interview, which was somewhat insulting to the to the editor. Who, when it came out, 
and I gave him a copy, told me that I'd never work in publishing again, <laughs> which since I wasn't working in publishing, wasn't much of a threat at the time. It, it turned out that other people in the firm had read it and thought it was wonderful because they all hated the bugger. They, that, they, um, and so, so when, when he left, and, and, and uh, a guy called Alistair Graham, who unfortunately recently died, but Alistair called me and he said, uh, you know, I, I, would you like a job as assistant editor? Because uh, you know, I'm now the editor. And he also confided to me that he was going to be leaving because he was another musician and he was going to be leaving to do music within about six months so that if I took the job as assistant editor, there's a very good chance I'd, you know, I'd have the job as, as editor. That's exactly what happened. I mean, I, I tell you the truth, I was, I was a bit uh, nervous of taking the job because I was only 16. I was working for a very nice company, but um, I was just a, an office boy, really. But they all they all seemed to like the cut of my jib in this in this firm, and they all wanted me. They all, they all had idea, big ideas for me. You know, one of them wanted to send me to university, and other one wanted you know, all this. So they all encouraged me to to take the job. And so by the time I was sixteen, I was I was actually you know by the time Alistair had left, I was actually editing a, a national mag magazine. It was a, it was a juvenile <laughs> magazine, but because I liked the pulp so much, I sort of turned it into a kind of kids' pulp magazine with a lot of stuff about Burroughs, of course, and, and I got rid of the Western strip and put it and got Jim Cawthorn, who'd been doing stuff for the fanzines, to draw a science fiction strip. And he also wrote fantasy, Conan-type fantasy stories, and I wrote Burroughs-type fantasy stories. I'd been writing them actually bef just before I got the, 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 the job. I'd, because I'd been writing them for the fanzine to begin with. They, they, that was so John the Swordsman. They, I mean, they were just straight Burroughs type stories. But that's how I started writing that kind of story. So, I, and I also was it was a keen fan of a detective series called Sexton Blake Library, which had been running. Sexton Blake had been running since I think the 1880s or 1890s. The Sexton Blake Library was, I think, by the time I was working on it, there were two issues a month basically paperback paperback novels uh, about this character Sexton Blake. The editor of that had also changed it and the, the people who, who who were Sexton Blake fans were all up in arms about how they you know he'd ruined ruined Sexton Blake. And I felt like defending him. I mean I actually still preferred the thirties style Sexton Blake and those are the ones I read. But for some reason I just felt that he was being hard done by so I wrote this piece defending him, which he read, and once again, offered me a job. So so when I left Tarzan Adventures, which I did because I wanted to travel, and, and, and again, I was playing music at the same time, you know, and things were getting a little bit easier for to get gigs. So when, but when I needed a, an actual <laughs> paying job, or de relatively decently paying job, I asked him if, you know, if, the, if he had a job, and he said, yes, you know, you, I, you in in about three months, there will be a job you know, coming up. You, you know, you can be assistant editor. There already was one assistant. There were two assistant editors, and I was one of them. And so I I became assistant editor of that. And also, this was a firm called Fleetway, which at the time was the largest publisher of popular magazines and popular fiction of the day in in the world. So it had a you know it was a, it was a it was a pretty, they paid, their rates were really good. So much so that, 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 that American comic writers you know, discovered this, I think, in the, quite fairly late in the 60s, uh, late 60s, or middle 60s, and began writing for, for those papers because, because the money was so much better. I started working for Sexton Blake as, a, as a, an editorial assistant. I also was put in charge of doing... I mean, it's a bit hard to describe because these things don't exist in, in America, really. But they're, they're every year, at the end of every year, the, most of the popular titles published an annual in which a hardback annual for Christmas, which contained stories by, you know, about Buffalo Bill and Dick Turpin and all the various other characters that they, they had in, in them. I had a knack for writing comics, uh, which isn't 
you know, which isn't which not everybody has, as it, it turns out. I didn't know that, but I could I could write them pretty quickly. And so by the time I was eighteen, I was earning incredibly good money, and of course spending it like water, um, mostly on mostly on uh, alcohol and good food and and uh, young women. Um, <laughs> And having a great time, you know, I, I, I did that until I think about 1961, the, the big publishers, uh, there were three major publishers, began to amalgamate. And I was a member of the union as well. Uh, and um, until I was 21, which was 1961, I couldn't actually be active in the union. I couldn't be a member of the union committee because there wasn't anything that allowed for somebody as young as me to be in that position. It was a very weird, weird situation. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was in the union, and there were a lot of people who depended on those comics, you know, married people. I, I wasn't, but, but I mean, people who actually needed the money rather than spent it the way I did, who were harmed by changes that came about around that time by the amalgamation because the the uh, fleet way as it became known it would pay on on acceptance of the material but it then changed it to pay on publication which could be 18 months two years after you'd written it and this really was bad not not so much for me i mean it, it was it was <laughs> it was i didn't like it but it it didn't you know it didn't it didn't didn't affect me too badly, but for the married people who, who you know, with young families, uh, they were they were having a fairly hard time of it. So, so I was pretty active in the union at that time, and as a result, I clashed with you know with the with the bosses. Eventually, it was very strange. I was I, I was never a, a, a communist. In fact, I was very anti-communist. I was more an anarchist than a communist. You know, and. and uh, they decided that I was a communist. They somehow got it into their heads that I was a, you know, an active member of the Communist Party. And the sort of the main boss of my my department was terrified of the of, the, of communism, and he felt that at any moment the Red Army would come marching up Fleet Street you know, and take <laughs> over the magazines. And so he 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 didn't. I, I didn't get fired. I never really knew this until later after I'd left. That uh, that this was his you know this was his his understanding of me. He thought you know I'd be like what's his name in Doctor Shibago, <laughs> the little you know rimless glasses and the luger and so on, sort of grimly marching into into his office and taking him over. And I had no idea about this at all. Uh, but but there it was. It saved me from from getting fired. I eventually left because the working conditions just were no longer as friendly and happy as they had been. I mean, they'd been pretty, pretty, pretty good for, for a long time. And I met a lot of friends at Fleetway. But as I say, I learned to write comics there. And I just wrote uh, after I left. I wasn't just writing comics. I was writing features for other, for other magazines. By that time, I was writing sort of adult features and, and, uh, and a little bit of fiction, not very much. And one day I was actually in Fleetway uh, delivering I don't know, whatever it was I'd, I'd written that week, when uh, Harry Harrison, uh, who was, who, I don't know if you, I mean, he's a, another well-known science fiction writer Absolutely, his day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stainless Steel Harry, Rat. That's right. Death World was uh, one of his books, and he'd adapted it for, for one of the comics. And he, and he was writing comics for, for another magazine. And I knew him, and I knew the editor of the magazine. He said, uh, he said, oh, yeah, you know, we're uh, um, we're going over the road to the White Swan after you know after this, and uh, and Ted Carnell's going to be there. You know, I knew I knew because of a pub called the Globe, where every pretty much everybody in science fiction met uh, once a week at a, at a in a in a in that pub. I, I knew them all anyway, and I was already kind of uh, a professional, so I was sort of in a very strange position of being quite a young teenager. But with these older guys, but uh, they kind of, I suppose, gave me the respect of, you know, being <laughs> of, 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 uh, earning the same, my living in the same way. Anyway, so I said, yeah, fine. So we went, we went over to the pub, and Ted and I got to talking, and and Ted was bemoaning the loss of, of certain weird tales stories, and, and in particular Robert E. Howard 
C.L. Moore and, and the, the people, in fact, who were writing what became known as Sword and Sorcery, but didn't really have a name at that time. And he said, you know, I'd really like a, I'd really like to do a you know, Conan-type story. Well, as it happened, I'd, I'd, I'd done about 10,000 words of a Conan story for Hans Stefan Sanderson, who was running a magazine called Fantastic Universe. And he was running Conan stories, which Sprague de Camp was mostly doing. So I said, well, I said, oh, you know, I've got, got 10,000 words, you know, if you'd like to see it. He said, sure, yeah, you know, I'd like to see it. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd published a couple of short stories in, in New Worlds, which was uh, the companion to science fantasy, which is the magazine he wanted the fantasy for. I sent him the sort of quasi-Conan story. And he wrote back, or I don't know whether he wrote or whether he phoned, or whatever, anyway, he, he came back with, uh, and he said, well, I don't really want a Conan story. You know, I want something in that manner. A fantasy, you know, sort of, it, again, it wasn't called Sword and Sorcery then, because, it, in fact, it was called Sword and Sorcery by Fritz Leiber, and, and I've got a story about that. We were talking in, in, a, in another magazine called Amra, another fanzine called Amra. Fritz, were, Fritz and I, and I think one other guy, and we were offering ideas of what to call this stuff, you know, that we were all writing by that time. I suggested epic, epic fantasy and or heroic fantasy, I think those are the two, my two suggestions. And Fritz suggested, because the sword and sandal epic was doing so well at the time, and these were the, those Italian sort of historicals about Hercules or some other, you know, uh, the, um, which, which were called sword and sandal epics. And uh, so, so in, in jest, really, Fritz said, well, well, you know, what about sword and sorcery? So, and that's, that's in fact, ex how, the, how the name caught on. Um, I didn't think it was quite, quite posh enough, really. It sounded, <laughs> you know, it sounded a bit too <laughs> jokey. I, I still preferred epic fantasy, but, but, but you know, <laughs> there it was, this <laughs> one. Get back to the, the, the story I, I did for Ted. Ted said, no, he said, I, I really don't want, you know, I don't want a Conan story or anything like that. I really want something that has the same the same kind of feel to it. So at the time, there really was only Robert E. Howard and, and Fritz, of course. John Jakes, I think, had done a few in, in Fantastic Adventures, um, which weren't very good. They were Brack the Bar Barbarian, I think, and they were just really, they really were just Conan stories, you know, not very Conan stories. And Tolkien, and, and I, I didn't, I hadn't really liked Tolkien. I, I, I think I came to him too late after I'd read a lot of other other stuff that I preferred, mostly American stuff, actually. I knew Tolkien, or rather I'd met him, and he was a very nice man, as was C.S. Lewis, who'd introduced me to, to, to Tolkien. I certainly had nothing against him personally. I just didn't like what they write, wrote very much. So, I, so I, um, I thought, well, you know, I'll try and do something that's as different from what there was, which wasn't that much, uh, as possible. And and that's how I came to do the Elric stories for, for, for Ted. And I really only did one. I didn't think I'd ever, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect to do another. And they became a big hit in the magazine. I, mean, I had no idea. Because <laughs> um, I, you know, I was only, what, what was I, 20, 21 when, when, I, when I first started doing them. I, I thought it was a bit of good luck. I was, I was doing one, let, let alone, you know, let alone a series. But it was one of those things, you know, it was, it was the same sort of story that was going on with, with rock and roll at the, at the time. You know, people who just started out as... as uh, basically little skiffle bands playing locally suddenly got a got a big hit and in a way of course it was it was pretty much the same sort of story as a lot of my friends were becoming well-known musicians uh, or you know getting 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 suddenly becoming stars and and the same thing happened to me in the in the in the in the science fiction world and I and it's at that point that I really did give up music because for me music was or playing music was still it still involves sitting in the back of a of a of a of a Ford van, um, usually on the wheel hub, um, you know, going to going to a to a local hall somewhere in you know city hall somewhere and and, uh, and playing to an audience of of eight enthusiasts. So so um, I, it wasn't much of a 
of a strain for me to 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 decide that I you know that I'd, I'd spend my time writing rather than or more of my time writing than, than than doing music. Although I continued to do music, I was in sort of odd bands off and on through that whole period. And where I lived was happened to be a kind of hub of of music. So so I I. I, I I knew, I still knew a lot of musicians and still played a bit, not very seriously. Uh, Michael, when it comes to Elric, now this is a question from my friend Joe. Listeners of the show will know him as the vocalist from the band Doom Sword. He wonders if you consider Elric an anarchist, and if true, do you see a bit of yourself in Elric? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, if, if chaos is anarchism, and I, and I, I think you can you can argue that it, that it can be. Then certainly, I mean, you know, there's there's no question of it. As I said, in, I, I, and I wrote this somewhere again in a fanzine because I was still writing for fanzines at, at that age. That a lot of the early Elric stories, or all of the Elric stories, really were were personal. They were me. I mean, I was when when you know Elric was a 21 year old kid with with a lot of angst as it were mm. and uh, there wasn't much difference between you know me and me and Elric at that time um except of course I wasn't going around stealing people's souls and uh, and, and and slicing slicing up various villains although I might have I, I might have wanted to but yes I was always a, I was actually an anarchist um this is why it was so funny them calling me a communist because you know Anarchism was pretty much the opposite of, of communism, you know, to do with individual liberty and so on. And so it was it, that that was the irony of, of the Fleetway guys thinking I, I was a commie. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, this is a question that comes up a lot in forums that I've been in and Facebook fan groups. If a new reader were to approach you and ask you where to begin with the Elric saga, where would you suggest? Well, I'd probably suggest now that they start with the new, ser- you know, the new recently um, done series that that uh, Simon Schuster have just done, because they they published the them from the sort of early El- Elric stories through to the to the final ones in a, in in rough in sort of rough order because they're not that easy to put in order sometimes, some of them. So, yeah, I mean, I'd just say I wouldn't tell them to buy the, the hardbacks. It depends on their age and, and financial situation. <laughs> but, I'd, uh, but, I, but I'd certainly tell them to wait for the paperbacks to come out, you know, or see if they could get them secondhand. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th- that that is pretty much the order that I would suggest they be read in. I did do a series for... Del Rey in, in well it must have been around nine, uh, 20, 25 or something like that 20, 2005 I did a series which was specifically for curious readers who who who, who wanted to know what the the circumstances of the of how the Elric stories came out and those were published in publication order rather than in chronological mm. or, you know, internal chronological order and there was a lot of other stuff in them you know sort of other material to try and give the sense of how they came to be at the time they were being written they i mean they uh, they, they were beautifully illustrated i mean i had a lot of really good illustrators john Picasso and you know some of the best best illustrators around i think they'd be a bit confusing for people who just wanted to you know get into it and just you know, enjoy it and just immerse themselves in it as, as stories. So I think I think the the latest series is probably the best best way to read them. I have to ask specifically about Michael Whalen. What are your thoughts on his work for Elric, and have you guys ever met? Yeah, we've met. Um, it's it's a bit difficult for me. I mean, I, I really love Michael Whalen's work. I think he, 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 when he first started working for Daw, I think it was. I mean, Don Don Walheim is a, is a, is not often not enough praised for the amount of the, the chances he gave to a lot of writers as well as artists. But uh, Michael didn't just do uh, Elric; he did the Oswald Bastable stories and and a lot of my other other novels. And as well as that, he did a lot of other stuff for Dork. And he, I mean, he seemed to, you know, be 
great from the moment he started. It was, it was, uh, it was there's, no, there's no, there's no sort of rough period with uh, with Frazetta, for instance. You can tell, you know, there's a bit of uh, early Frazetta is rougher than later Frazetta. But with 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 Michael Whelan, he just seemed to spring, you know, spring out of the head of Zeus, uh, <laughs> fully formed. Um, so and and those covers were wonderful covers for selling the books i mean they really were great great for doing that in america in particular uh, there were other artists in england who were who were good and who i also acknowledge as being helpful in selling the books but the only thing that that irritated me with michael was that he never acknowledged when he resold when he sold second rights on on the stories the normal thing is is to give a credit you you know if uh, this is the no- this is just the normal practice in the business you gave a credit to where the thing had first appeared and he didn't do that so that uh, you know they appeared on record covers and calendars and all all kinds of things and he never once uh, said you know based on the Elric character or anything like that and I've always been just me and I'm being a bit snotty I suppose but and you know I've been I edited New Worlds as well as other other periodicals and I've always believed in giving credit to to the originals as it were I've, 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 whatever they are and I felt that he should have done that other, other most other artists did do it and he didn't so that that's my irritation with him I mean but, but it doesn't mean I'm going to get Stormbringer out of the out of the out of the <laughs> gun cupboard and come <laughs> running after him at, at any point um, and I do like his work and admire it very much um, I just uh, that was my only irritation is that they, you know, they started appearing everywhere and and, the, and that they should should at least have said where the character, you know, who the character was. But it's not. Uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm not furious about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, this is something I like to ask everyone. And since we're wind, uh, going to be winding down here, have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Oh yeah, constantly. Not that I believe in, I don't believe at all in the paranormal or, 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 or the supernatural, but I've had, a, I've seen God knows how many apparitions. I remember when I was, uh, I think probably the first, it was very weird because I, I wasn't brought up with any uh, religion. I, I, you know, I wasn't brought up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an actively anti-religious household, but I just wasn't brought up with any kind of religion. It just, it's just, which was fairly common in those days. I mean, England is one of the least, the, I mean, the ridiculous thing about King Charles is it's one, <laughs> you know, he's swearing all this stuff. And England is one of the, the most secular countries in the world. Religion wasn't a big thing anywhere, really, that, that I, with kids that I knew. But when I was at I was at boarding school for a while, and I got sick. Uh, no, no, before that, I had a, I saw a figure of a of a man in in I suppose Elizabethan costume come into the room. But I but I but even then I didn't I didn't think it was it was supernatural. I thought it was me, as it were, visualizing it. Mm. Then. Later on, throughout my entire childhood, I had lots and lots of, of, of visions of that kind. No, nothing much happening with them, but just 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 seeing seeing people and, and so on. I even, oh, that's what I was going to say. I, I was I had one of I, I had one in, <laughs> very very strange, and I saw this picture of Jesus come through a window. Uh, it was the it was the whole business. I mean, the whole as it were. Catholic business with Jesus, you know, looking like he, he would in a in a in an illustrated Bible. Why that was, I don't know, because the school wasn't religious either. But it happened, and then later on, I, I remember. I mean, this is a this is an example. I remember seeing a, a, we were we were in a town called Woodstock, not the same Woodstock as <laughs> in the States, but another Woodstock. The I suppose the original Woodstock. I don't know. This in this town called Woodstock. I saw in this shop a full suit of Japanese samurai armor. I'm not that interested in Japanese uh, samurai either. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, some people are, but I'm not one of those. And I, I, Linda was ahead of me, my, my wife, and she, she said, she said, what's up? I, I said, come on, come back here. Come look at this great suit of samurai armor. And when we got back, and this was like Don Quixote more than anything, when we got back to the shop, it was a, it was a hardware shop. 
and it was selling buckets and uh, you know spades and and <laughs> and uh, hammers and all that stuff. And I just made it up out of sheer you know pure pure um, imagination, I suppose. So I have had lots of lots and lots of of, of, of other kinds of supernatural experience. I used to see people's auras, for instance, when I at a time when I was I was reading about such things. It's not hard for me to, to sort of get involved in that sort of thing. But I never I never saw it as being anything but a, an ordinary phenomenon. Uh, just something that, that, that I I was projecting rather than something that uh, that was you know being sent to me or anything like that. It's a very, it's an odd sort of life in a way because it is, I, you know, I, I just had this very strong visual imagination. For some reason, I, I seem to, you know, that's what I seem, I seem to, I seem to be able to see all this stuff. Frequently, I mean, you know, here in Texas, I, I still, I still, you know, I still see like groups of horsemen or, you know, stuff like that. But I don't, but, and, but I'm not, I'm a, I'm a believer in, what, what would you call it? Meta natural, uh, but um, in the supernatural, in the sense that there, there, you know, there are things we don't, we know, we know little about, and which probably exist. But I don't see them as being how, say, Lovecraft would see them, or 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 M. R. James, or what you know, the the, the horror story writers would see them. Right. In fact, I'm I'm terrified of horror stories. I can't read. Lovecraft or or James or anybody. I mean, I, I, reading a horror story really leaves me leaves me um, terrified for weeks afterwards. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I once said, you know, I can hand it out, but I, but I can't take it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Michael, before uh, just so your battery doesn't run out, we get cut off mid sentence here. We just want to say yeah. thank you so much, you know, for giving us some of your time. Oh and, well, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Um, and uh, you know if. Uh, if there's anything else you you know you've, you've forgotten to ask me or would like to ask me, or just just send me an email and I'll gladly send you something back. Okay, that's the question. Thank you, hey, sir. Thank you, Michael. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Good. Okay, pleasure for me too. Thank you. You have a great rest of your day. Yeah, great. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Mr. Moorcock. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time monsters madness and magic <laughs> welcome to the night you think you know night demon then the night demon heavy metal podcast is for you step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented all access look into the mind and the heart of the demon we're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.